certainly appreciate this opportunity to speak to you again. And what I'm going to speak on is somewhat similar to the last time that I spoke to you, but not exactly the same. Now, there mentioned in the Bible, there's, there's uh, two commissions mentioned in the New Testament. And actually, there are three, and we'll, we'll get around to that. <clears throat> there's a limited commission of the 12 disciples, as recorded in Luke, the ninth chapter, verses 1 through 6. And it reads in part there, Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons, and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And then down further it says, So they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Then there's the Great Commission recorded in Matthew, the 28th chapter, verses 18 through 20. And it says in part there, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And we read further in Mark 16, 15, and 16 in part, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now the major differences between the limited commission of the twelve and the Great Commission were its scope and its message. In the Limited Commission, <clears throat> the geographical area was limited to the area around Judea, that is, the uh, lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew, the 10th chapter, verses 5 through 15. Its message was the com coming of the kingdom of God, that, that's heaven. The Great Commission was to proclaim that the kingdom of heaven had arrived and provided the instructions as to how to enter it. Now we know from these two passages that the all things that I have commanded you in the gospel are the same thing. To be saved from one's sins, one must obey the gospel, which is the same meaning as observing all things that I have commanded you, same thing. But there was a second limited commission of the 70, as recorded in the Luke the 10th chapter, verses 1 and 2. There it reads, After these things the Lord appointed 70 others also, and sent them two by two before his face into every city, the same way they sent the twelve, two by two, and uh, every city and place where he himself was about to go. They were to heal the sick there and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you, Luke 10 and 9. The twelve disciples, however, were given power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. We read in Luke the 10th chapter, verses 17 through 20, it first says there, that Then the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to your name, to us in your name. There is no indication that they knew beforehand that the demons would be subject to them. Maybe they did. There's no indication of it. Nevertheless, the demons were subject to them when they commanded the demons by the authority of Christ. As the scripture says, the 70 returned with joy. The Lord did not begrudge them the joy of the moment, rather he called their attention to something far more important. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> the Lord did not see Satan falling from heaven, but he saw him falling as quickly as lightning falls from heaven. Furthermore, he gave the 70 authority over anything that might harm them and power over that old adversary, the devil, and his minions. 
by the same means that allowed them to subjugate the demons, that is, in his name. Although their joy was a result of their subjugation of the demons, the Lord did not want that to be the chief reason for their joy. He wanted them to rejoice because their names were written in heaven. Luke 10.20 reads, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, <clears throat> but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Now I ask, uh, who doesn't want the, their names written in heaven? <clears throat> Everyone wants their name written in heaven. You say, well, what about the atheist who does not admit that there is, is even a heaven? Oh, he wants his name written in heaven. <laughs> we read in Romans 14, chapter, verse 11, For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess God. That includes the, the, the atheist and every other person that has ever lived. Only those whose names are written in the book of life can enter heaven. In Revelation 21, verse 27, we find this statement. But there shall be by no means enter it, that is the uh, new spiritual Jerusalem, anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. <clears throat> now I want to say this, that there is not really a physical Lamb's book of life. God does not need anything to uh, prick his uh, remembrance. He knows everything. But that's stated for our benefit. It's the book of life and names written in heaven. Come judgment time, God is not going to say, well, let me check uh, page uh, 324. Just I think your name's there somewhere, but let me look for it. That's not going to be the case. He's going to know. But previously in Revelation, the 20th chapter, verses 11 through 15, it says in part, There I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. The books were the Old and New Testament. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which are written. You know, he referred to John 12, 48. And it says down at the end of that uh, citation, anyone not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. Clearly then, those whose names are not written in heaven will be cast into hell. To have one's name written in heaven is to have one's name written in the book of life. To have one's name written in heaven, that is, the book of life, is to be welcomed into that celestial city as one of the blessed dead, as is stated in Revelation 14, 13, which we covered last time I spoke. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, <clears throat> Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. And who are the blessed dead? It is not those who merely claim affinity with our Lord, for the Lord declares plainly in Revelation 14, 12, that it is those who keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. To have one's name written in heaven is to be one of the blessed dead, it is to keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. The faith of Jesus is the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints in Jude, verse 3, which is the gospel. God's power to save, Romans 1.16. And I just <clears throat> might add that that is God's only power to save. No one is saved except through the gospel. <clears throat> In John 12.48, Jesus said that he who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word which I have spoken will judge him in the last day. <clears throat> And one thing we've learned from the prophets is God always leaves instructions. He doesn't expect us to do anything that he hasn't uh, disclosed to us first. Paul stated in Ephesians, the first chapter, verse 13, In him 
you also trusted after you heard the word of truth and the gospel of your salvation. So the gospel is your, your salvation, same as the word of truth. He further made this statement uh, as recorded in Colossians 1st chapter, verses 3 through 6. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for the saints because of the hope which is laid up to you in heaven, <clears throat> of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world. The human hand that wrote the epistle of Hebrews said that, therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word they heard, which they heard, did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> Paul, uh, Peter, the apostle to the circumcised, wrote in 1 Peter, fourth chapter, verses 17 and 18, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God, and if it begins with us first, what will the end be of those who do not obey the gospel of God? We are blessed to have in our possession the final and complete record of the word of the truth of the gospel, that is, the gospel of God. So, <clears throat> is your name written in heaven? That is the greatest question of all time. Furthermore, it is a question that will be answered. Does the Lord take note of these matters? Yes, he does, for he says in 1 Peter third chapter verse 12 that the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil as I said one's name is not written in heaven merely by claiming affinity with the Lord in Matthew 7 21 we read that not everyone who says to me Lord Lord shall enter the kingdom of heaven <clears throat> but he who does the will of my father in heaven from what has been said, we know that we must obey the words of truth, the gospel, God's power to save, which is the same as observing all things I have commanded you, which is the same as keeping the commandments of God, which is the same as keeping the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints, which is the same as doing the will of our Father in heaven. We are acquainted with some who have not obeyed the gospel, but are by any measure very moral people. In fact, we could only hope that this nation would recognize and observe a system of morality as do these individuals. But morality alone is not the entirety of doing the will of our Father in heaven, and therefore it alone cannot save anyone. We read in Acts, the 10th chapter, verses 1 through 7, in part, it's about, of course, about Cornelius. He was a devout man and one who feared God with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. <clears throat> and about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly a vision of angels of God. And he was told there that your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. They will send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter, and he will tell you what you must do. It is said that Cornelius was a devout man, one who had great respect for God, who was very generous with his means and prayed to God continually. Yet to be saved, he needed to hear the words of truth, the gospel. Does it make any difference what we hear? Well, Jesus seemed to think so for... He warned, take heed what you hear, Mark 4.24, and take heed how you hear, Luke 8.18. Cornelius seemed to think so as well. He sent to Peter to hear the things commanded by God, Acts 10.43. Peter did not say that belief alone would result in remission of sins. He also said that the benefits of repentance had been granted 
to the Gentiles, Acts 11, verse 14. Then Cornelius was commanded to be baptized in the name of the Lord, Acts 10, 48. As I already set forth, Jesus said that he who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day, John 12, 48. <clears throat> Now let me emphasize again that we will be judged by the words of Jesus, which are the all things that I have commanded you and the gospel. No one has authority from heaven to add to or to take away from the words of Jesus, Revelation 22, verses 18 through 19. In Matthew 15, chapter verse 9, Jesus rebuked men for obeying doctrines of men, saying, In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. In Colossians, the second chapter, verses 20 through 22, we see the heavenly attitude toward those who would change the word of God. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? We're talking about human regulations. Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. Paul says that these things have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, Colossians 4th chapter, verse 1. <clears throat> he further says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow in all things into him who is the head of who is the head which is Christ that's Ephesians the fourth chapter verses 14 and 15 yes doctrine matters to have our names written in heaven we must follow the doctrine of Christ the truth his word the gospel the commandments of God the will of God the faith once for all delivered to the saints now, sincerity is not enough to have our names written in heaven. When we first heard of Paul, known then as Saul, he was persecuting the church. He was, uh, it was said that he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison, Acts 8, chapter verse 3. He sincerely believed that he was doing the will of heaven. <clears throat> He said that, uh, indeed, I thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, Acts 26, verse 9. He would say with conviction that, men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God to this day, even when he was persecuting the church, Acts 23, verse 1. But as he was journeying to Damascus, he had an encounter with Jesus that persuaded him sincerity was not enough. He was told to see a man named Ananias. After telling Paul what was appointed for him to do, Ananias said, And now why are you waiting? Now rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord, Acts 22, verse 16. His sincerity counted for little when he was acting contrary to the will of heaven. Obedience, however, counted for everything. We read... In the 37th chapter of Genesis, that Jacob, when presented with a blood-soaked tunic of his son Joseph, mourned grievously for him because he sincerely believed that wild animals had torn him asunder. But his grief was based on fabrication and not on truth. His sincerity made it no less a lie, nor did the lie make him any less sincere. All of this is to say that we should critically question what we sincerely believe against some objective static standard, in this case, the Bible rightly divided, <clears throat> 2 Timothy 2.15. Of course, this happens to us also. I want to give you a little, little illustration, and it's about Nancy's daddy. He was born in Puerto Rico in 1908. Now, you recall that the United States acquired Puerto Rico in 1898 and the Philippines as well after the defeat of Spain in the Spanish-American War. It is widely accepted 
today that those born in, in the United States or its territories are considered citizens of the United States. Back then, to become an American citizen, a Puerto Rican born as a citizen of Spain had to become, uh, had to declare loyalty to the United States to become an American citizen. After his uh, marriage to Nancy's mother, <clears throat> they took a trip to Puerto Rico to meet uh, his family. The immigration officials in Puerto Rico informed him that his father, who was born in Spain, never did swear loyalty to the U.S. Uh, I might just add a little side note. His father, uh, that's Nancy's grandfather, was a food taster for Generalissimo Maximo Gomez. He was a military commander of Cuban independence forces in Cuba. Now, I don't know what else he had to do, but he, he certainly got good meals. <laughs> Therefore, he was not a citizen. At that time, uh, children of non-citizens were not regarded as citizens. So he had to return to Texas as a citizen of Spain. And up to this time, he had voted in every election. He had gotten, of course, married. He got a college degree and all that stuff. All the time thinking he was a citizen. Well, it mattered uh, little to the immigration officials that he sincerely believed he was a citizen of the U.S. from his birth through college and marriage. Now, how many think today they're citizens of the kingdom, but they're not? They were having complied with the citizenship laws of the kingdom. Many today believe sincerely that they serve Christ but are following the doctrines of men rather than the word of God. Jesus will, will tell them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, Matthew 7, 23. What a terrible thing to hear. These individuals worship in vain because they teach as doctrine the commandments of men. Matthew 5, 15, 9, and Mark 7, verse 7. What well, can one whose name was once written in heaven have his name erased? Jesus said that every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Matthew 15, uh, chapter 15, verse 13. And every plant will be known by its fruit. Matthew 12, chapter verses 33 through 37. <clears throat> and there's going to be a time of uprooting. Yes, one who once loved Jesus may have their lampstand, that is salvation, removed. The words of Jesus are recorded in Revelation, the second chapter, verses 4 and 5. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly to remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. While there may be widespread agreement on most things that are required to have our names written in heaven, the major sticking point seems to be baptism. Can any disagree that one who is in Christ, that is, a child of God, clothing him, as it were, will have their name written in heaven? Paul wrote in Galatians, the third chapter, verses 26 and 27, that you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. In Romans, the sixth chapter, verse 3, he wrote, Do you not know that... As many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. And it is customary <clears throat> to bury the dead for, for obvious reasons. Paul stated in Colossians, the second chapter, verse 12, that those who are buried with him in baptism <clears throat> will be raised with him. Don't you want to be raised from spiritual death, from a burial of the old spiritual body, dead body? To be, raised, to be raised a new creature in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. To walk in newness in, in Christ, Romans 6, verse 4. When that proverbial road is called up yonder, will your name be recorded in the book of life? Christ wants you to be there. He looked upon Jerusalem and saw the names, uh, those names were not recorded in heaven and admitted it greatly. He said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stoned those who are sent to her. 
how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. <clears throat> Matthew, the 23rd, chapter verse 37, also in Luke 13, chapter verse 34. John described the church as the holy city, the new Jerusalem, as a bride adorned for her husband, Revelations 21, verses 2 and 3. The bride is the church, described as the wife of the Lamb, Revelations 21, verse 9. And it is the spirit and the bride, they both say, come. And let him who thirst, uh, whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely, Revelations 22nd chapter, verse 17. I fear greatly that we just don't have enough thirsty people. If your name is not written in the book of life, I want to offer this opportunity now for you to have your name written by confessing him as your savior and repenting of your sins and, and uh, being baptized into Christ so that you can be raised to a new life with him. Shall we do so as we stand and sing?